Hi guys, Dr. Gillard here. We are starting uh, Tuesday's first endocrinology lecture. This would be for Monday. And we left off, I don't know, what did we leave off talking about? We are talking about the R2A system and the macula densa and such, things like that. But let's look more closely now at how angiotensin II affects the body. Great board stuff right here, right? You need to know angiotensin II's effects. So here we go. Let's just look at a little anatomy too before we go into this. Here is a cross-sectional view of the, what, well, you tell me what that is. Yeah, it's the adrenal gland. Remember the adrenal gland, it has a capsule, which isn't that important, but it has a cortex, uh, which is right here. That is where all the three stars of the show are. Then it has a medulla in here. The three stars of the show are the three layers. You probably should learn this in high school, I bet, but make sure you know this. This is an easy softball question. You can't miss questions like this. I always remember it, the little mnemonic is GFR for a glomerular filtration rate. That was probably burned into your brains by uh, Dr. Doe, I bet. So if you use GFR, it gives you the zones. So we have the zona granulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis, who do you think the cells are? Glomerulosa cells, fasciculata cells, reticularis cells, right? So make sure you know that. Again, I apologize for the kids. They're running wild through the neighborhood. I, that's why I turned a little background music. Maybe I can draw, drown some of that out, but we just have to deal with it. Angiotensin II versus aldosterone. So let's look at what angiotensin, some of its activities are. Uh, so it definitely affects aldosterone. Angiotensin II binds to the adrenal glomerulosa cells, right, in the zona glomerulosa, and it stimulates them to produce aldosterone. Specifically, there's two types of receptors. There's AT1 and AT2. It binds to AT1 receptors for the most part, and the binding causes the release of the hormone aldosterone. A fun fact about angiotensin II with regard to the release of aldosterone, it's the second, not the first, strongest stimuli for the release of aldosterone. The serum concentration of potassium is stronger. That's the champion. What else does it? Oh, I guess we're still talking. What, what else does aldosterone do in general? Because we're kind of, and we're going to actually hit aldosterone before we get out of this. I probably could have cut this off. But in general, of course, it conserves salt and water. What does that mean, conserves? That means it pulls it back. Pulls it back from where? The kidney. Right? All right, so it conserves salt and water from the proximal convoluted tubules is one big place it does. Uh, if you conserve salt in water, and of course water fall, typically follows sodium, not all the time, uh, but if you increase salt in water, if you pull that back into the bloodstream, it's going to increase your blood volume because blood is mostly a lot, high percentage of water. If you increase your volume, you increase your pressure. So make sure you know these how these are related to each other. We'll look at this more in a minute. This is also, I think I said before, a slow mechanism. It takes about an hour uh, to increase pressure via aldosterone release. So thank goodness for the sympathetic tiger, which we talked about last time. What about angiotensin II versus smooth muscles? See, I think I talked about this, but AT2 also has receptors on smooth muscle cells of both the arterioles and the venules. And uh, yeah, it directly binds to them. You don't need the middleman nor epinephrine. Right? Sympathetic tiger doesn't bind right to them. It binds to the tunica adventitia and releases norepinephrine, and that binds to smooth muscle cells. Uh, so not true. The angiotensin II, it goes right and binds to the smooth muscle cells. Uh, and it causes a vasoconstriction. Well, what's going to happen if you vasoconstrict a blood vessel? Pressure goes up or pressure goes down? Pressure goes up. Again, it's a fairly slow mechanism. Uh, but this helps to maintain increased blood pressure uh, that someone went in our bleeding scenario, remember the carotid sinus and the nerve of herring immediately boosted blood pressure up, uh, but it peters out after a while. Well, this mechanism will kind of maintain that, so it's an important mechanism. 
uh, angiotensin 2 binds to smooth muscle. Uh, more specifically, if you want to get specific, I'm trying to fight off a cough here, angiotensin 2 binds to AT2, angiotensin 2 receptors. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> I've already done one lecture this morning and my voice is already going and it's not even Monday. Uh, angio 2 binds to A2-T2 receptors, which are on the smooth muscle. That's where it binds. Uh, this binding, if you want to get technical, it activates the diacylglycerol and also told triphosphate, secondary, secondary messenger system or second messenger system. And that causes calcium ion to dump into the uh, cytosol of the smooth muscle. And that, of course, causes a more sustained type contraction. Okay, what about ATT2, way angiotensin 2 in the adrenal medulla? Does it have any effects on the adrenal medulla? Not the cortex. I know you guys know the cortex. What about the medulla? Yeah, it's got it's got some receptors on it's got AT1 receptors on chromaffin cells. Not chromaffin like cells, which we're going to talk about GIGU in the stomach. Stomach glands, gastric glands. Uh, but yeah, chromaffin, they live in the adrenal medulla, and the binding of angiotensin 2 causes the release of the catecholamines. You definitely should know the catecholamines, right? Who are they? Norepinephrine and epinephrine are the main ones, and that mainly releases epinephrine, but a little bit of decent amount of norepinephrine, a tiny bit of dopamine. Uh, but yeah, that binding uh, does that. And these, of course, are the fight and flight hormones. Good idea. Uh, another little cartoon show you angiotensin 2. So it binds to chromaffin cells down here, and that causes the release in the adrenal medulla, purple area, causes the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, a little bit of dopamine. Uh, but it also binds over here to the zona glomerulosa and causes the release of aldosterone from, what's the name of zona glomerulosa cells? Simple. Uh, glomerulosa cells. Uh, these are AT1 receptors. Everything is good. Right? What about epinephrine versus the heart and blood vessels? So uh, epinephrine soaks into the SA node, causes that to speed up. That's the master pacemaker of the heart normally. And so the heart will go faster. If the heart is beating faster, the blood pressure will increase. It'll soak into the AV node. What does it do to the AV node? What decrease, it says right there, right? Decreases decremental conduction. Okay. Uh, so that means that the hold up, remember the AV node holds up the signal. And uh, it doesn't do that. It it's kind of bypasses that so more signals can get into the ventricles. Okay. Uh, it also can soak into the heart cardiac muscle itself and cause it more contract tractability, contractility makes it contract harder and the harder the, the stronger the heart contracts the higher the blood pressure goes and that's in our bleeding scenario that was the situation a little bit of redundancy here with angiotensin 2 so it also can bind directly to the cardiac myocyte and cause increased calcium release in the cytosol remember sympathetics these are directly plugged into cardiac myocytes, the sympathetics are. So we kind of got a redundant system here where the sympathetics and angiotensin 2 uh, both doing the same thing, increasing cardiac contractility. Heart beats stronger that way, forces more blood, raises the pressure. And then with regard to the tiger story, remember we talked about the sympathetic tiger last time, how the carotid sinus normally sends an inhibitory signal and, and the stronger that signal is the more strong that gate is shut not much sympathetic flow goes out get a drop in blood pressure and this all shuts off and the tiger gets out causes vasoconstriction raises your blood pressure um, so there's more to that but we said that can't go on forever that type of mechanism so this is an important one of angiotensin 2. It prolongs the flow of sympathetics out of the vasomotor center. How does it do that? It binds to the vasomotor center in the medulla, and it prolongs the sympathetic outflow. How does it do that? It helps hold that tiger, tiger cage gate 
uh, open. So I won't go into the full mechanism. That's enough. Uh, extremely important life-saving mechanism. Fairly quick mechanism, too. This is probably the quickest R2A effect on bleeding. Uh, so several minutes, uh, it can start to help. So that's probably the fastest we have. Still not as fast as nerve of herring and sympathetic outflow. What else can angiotensin do? Uh, it also has receptors on the thirst and salt centers in the hypothalamus. And once it binds to those, it makes a person very thirsty and they crave salt. Right? That's not always a bad sign. If you come upon an accident, person's really hurt badly laying on the pavement and they're super, super thirsty. You look around for blood, you don't see any blood, but that's a bad sign that they're bleeding internally. Right? Because uh, blood pressure is dropped and angiotensin 2, renin has caused the release of angiotensin 2, and that's stimulating the thirst centers. That person is thirsty. By drinking water and eating salt, that'll increase the blood volume to a slight degree, help with blood pressure. Not a super powerful mechanism, though. Not enough to save, save the person's life. What about the proximal convoluted tubule? How does AT2 have an effect on that? We haven't talked about that, I don't think, but it does. It actually, there's receptors. I think there are AT2 receptors, if I remember. Uh, but it binds to the proximal convoluted tubule. Remember, those are the potato pickers. And that binding stimulates our potato pickers, in that story, uh, to take up more sodium and water quite fast. Uh, so that's what it does. And what happens if salt and water are soaked out of the proximal convoluted tube, or not salt, sorry, uh, uh, no water, I mean. Oh, yeah, it does, so that's fine. But what happens if we take sodium out of the filtrate? Well, it becomes, it becomes low in sodium, and who freaks out? Good, macula densa. So that low sodium will stimulate macula densa. Uh, and that, of course, indirectly causes the release of renin. It stimulates the juxtacle marrow cells and says, hey, I'm freaking out. Sodium is too low. It must mean the blood pressure is too low, so we need to put more renin out. Renin is converted to angiotensin too. What about afferent, efferent renal arteries? We talked about those around the glomerulus, and it has an effect there too. It binds to the smooth muscle of the afferent and efferent arterioles, and the binding causes vasoconstriction. So what? Well, if you have vasoconstriction, the flow into the nephron is going to be decreased. And there goes your, your filtrate, your pressure, decreases the filtration pressure. Uh, and that's going to slow it down. The potato pickers are going to pick out too much sodium, and you know the rest of the story. Uh, the filtrate's going to become low on sodium, and the macula densa is going to freak out again because the sodium is low in the filtrate. That, again, indirectly stimulates the release of renin. Another one? Yeah, another one. Angiotensin 2. Uh, it binds to AT1 receptors that live in the hypothalamus and triggers the release of antidiuretic hormone. Ah, yeah, we're going to talk about that a lot, ADH. Arginine vasopressin is an AKA. Vasopressin is an AKA. Uh, mainly the big releaser of of ADH are magnocellular neurons. They live in the superoptic nuclei, paraventricular nuclei as well. But yeah, it has the magnocellular neurons has binding sites for angiotensin too, and you bind to those and it stimulates them and you crank out ADH. ADH will conserve free water. Does it conserve sodium? I'm gonna probably tell you this a thousand times. So you'll never miss that on some boards. No, ADH only conserves free water. It, sodium does not follow when ADH is involved. And we'll look at that mechanism. How about some renin inhibitors? Well, you want to, you want to shut off your release of renin, just boost up your, your blood pressure. Eat, eat, eat a ton of salt, right? That'll make you thirsty and you'll drink water and your volume will go up. It's not a super strong mechanism. Uh, but anything that causes hypertension will shut off renin. Uh, in fact, in trade for it, the natriuretic system, ANP, uh, is, and we'll talk about that more in specific when the time comes. But those are some common Turner offers. What about the activation of uh, a chronic act? What if the R2A system's on all the time? And can you think of 
what would cause the R2A system to be on all the time? Let's, okay, okay, I heard you. So you said a tumor compressing the renal artery. Yeah, that'll beaver dam, right? It causes downstream decreased flow, and that kidney's going to freak out. But, but let's not say, give me something else. What can chronically activate? Well, anything that causes hypotension will turn that R2A system chronically. Probably the most common is a bad heart, bad ticker. So in patients with chronic hypotension from things like heart failure, the pump just can't pressurize the system, or aortic stenosis where the heart can't push the blood out because the aortic valve is not opening like it's supposed to. Yeah, those are all create hypotension. Your body's not going to tolerate hypotension. You're going to have per decreased perfusion. Uh, so your heart's going to beat harder, and you're going to, you're going to have, uh, you're going to overcome that. And the R2A system is going to turn that uh, on, and you'll have a compensatory little hypertension because of that, probably. It doesn't make sense. If the pump is not working, how can you have hypertension? But it's because of the R2A system um, that you do. So, But that's not what we're worried about. Chronically, if your R2A system on all the time, if you have too much angiotensin running around all the time, too much aldosterone running around all the time, those can completely destroy your heart. Not your blood vessels, that's probably not the big problem. It's your heart that's the problem. So let's look at that. Uh, so elevated aldosterone and angiotensin 2 turn on certain genes in the myocardial cells. We won't get into who they are. Uh, but those genes crank out growth factors, and we won't even get into who they are. We know who they are. They crank out growth factors, and it also causes an inflammatory response, a little mysterious on how that works. But the growth factors is well known. But it does tend to cause an inflammation, which we're a little, uh, which we don't quite understand as well. Growth factors stimulate uh, one of their targets is fibroblasts. And fibroblasts do what fibroblasts do. They lay down scar tissue or collagen, a thick collagen. And that's going to happen all inside the substance of your heart. So your heart myocardium is going to be filled with scar tissue. And is that a good thing? No. How is that going to affect the beating heart if your heart is filled up with scar tissue? It's not going to beat very good. And it's going to lower the blood pressure even more because the heart is going to be worse. Uh, so, yeah, it's not good. It's also going to cause a large heart. It's going to make your heart physically thick. You'll get heart cardiac hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, and that also interferes with the ability of the heart to pump. And all those things, if your heart isn't pumping good, it worsens the hypotension. That causes a stronger release of renin, which causes more angiotensin 2 and more aldosterone. I didn't put that in here. Uh, but aldosterone's oh there it is right there, and yeah it's gonna cause the release of more growth factors and more scarring of the heart, which is gonna lower the blood pressure again, and you get this vicious cycle going on here. Uh, so what is the human to do? Uh, what's the solution? Well, drugs are the solution after you've tried you know, diet. Well, I mean diet's not gonna affect a failed heart. Uh, you're gonna have to use medication for this. Um, and so a couple ways you can do it. You can take drugs that flat out block the production of the little Tasmanian devil, angiotensin II, and they block aldosterone. Or you can take drugs called antagonists that they don't block the production of these, these hormones, but they go after the receptors because these hormones have to bind to their target tissue. So if you block the receptors, they can't bind. So these are the antagonist drugs, the receptor blockers. Uh, common, common receptor blockers uh, have been in the news lately, Vel, uh, Velstartan and Lostartan. Uh, those guys were recalled, not because of anything wrong with them, but uh, in China, the manufacturer process screwed up and it got tainted with NDMA, I think it was, uh, a very powerful ca uh, carcinogen. Um, so I haven't even heard anything if that's been corrected, but they pulled all these. Uh, very important for people with uh, failing hearts and things like that. All right, angio 2's effect on the adrenal gland. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Aldosterone versus angiotensin 2. 
so we kind of know this a little bit. Let's dig a little more. Uh, angiotensin II's target is the outer layer of the adrenal gland. Specifically, its target is AT2 receptors. Some research it targets AT1 receptors as well. AT2 or a primary target. What zona is it in? Well, the zona glomerulosis. What cells? Glomerulosis cells are what where the AT2 receptors are. And it stimulates if you bind angiotensin II to an AT2 receptor on a glomerulosa cell, it'll stimulate that cell to crank out uh, aldosterone, which of course is uh, one of the mineral corticoids. So here's the thing you usually don't know. There are some other things that can stimulate glomerulosa cells, uh, like uh, adrenal corticotropic hormone, ACTH, has a, it does have a stimulatory effect and can bind with glomerulosa cells as well. Uh, hyperkalemia, of course, has a super strong effect. In fact, that's the number one trigger for the release of aldosterone uh, is hyperkalemia. Too many potassium ions floating around. We'll come back to that one. This is a great study, kind of go to the boards, review this before you go to the boards, kind of an overview of where we're going. I'm not going to do all this right now, but we have talked about angiotensin II right here. We've said it's bound to the zona glomerulosa, uh, and it causes the release of el the mineral corticoids, aldosterone and deoxycorticosterone. Aldosterone's the big one. Angiotensin II also binds to chromaffin cells in the medulla, and that causes the release. Did I not put it down? Oh, yeah, I did. Epinephrine mainly, norepinephrine, I want to say 20%. Tiny bit of dopamine as well. Those are the catecholamines. Uh, and yeah, that's what that does. We won't go through ACTH, but we'll look at that when the time comes. How do you make aldosterone anyway? Oh, I do like my biochemistry. We will scratch a little, touch a little bit into biochemistry. Uh, so, because, yeah. Because there's some conditions, autoimmune disease, like Addison's disease. What's the number one cause of Addison's? S super common cause. It's an autoimmune attack of 21 hydroxylase. So you got to know your biochemistry. So how do you make this molecule right here, aldosterone? Uh, well, you take a cholesterol molecule, and via the, M the enzyme desmolase, it's converted into pregenolone. And via a non-important enzyme, there's no mutations with these non-important ones. Uh, it's converted to progesterone, right? That's a real common one. Just talked about that in my embryology lecture. Uh, it's converted into deoxycorticosterone uh, by a very important, I can't stress this enough, 21-hydroxylase. Uh, progesterone is converted into deoxycorticosterone, none are, which is converted into corticosterone by a not that important enzyme. Corticosterone is finally turned converted into aldosterone uh, by being exposed to aldosterone synthase, another important one. But of all these enzymes, this 21-hydroxylase is super important uh, because it's a target of your body. Some people, uh, some people's immune systems doesn't like the looks of it and the immune system attacks it. And if you knock out this enzyme, you can't convert progesterone to deoxycorticosterone. This step is broken. Therefore, there's no way to make aldosterone. That's a big problem, right, if you don't have aldosterone around. Right? All kinds of problems. We'll look at some of those problems in a bit. Uh, the progesterone can go this way. Uh, can it make cortisol? You cannot live without aldosterone and cortisone. This pathway over, the, over here, DHEA and the estrogens, you can live without these, and we can actually make it with 21-hydroxylase. We can actually make DHEA, and we can make estrogen. Uh, so, But that doesn't really matter because that doesn't keep you alive. We can't make cortisol, or we can't L make, make aldosterone if you have a mutation in 21-hydroxylase. That's a really tough gene. Uh, you can still be alive but medication and all sorts of stuff. You'll have to take cortisol and, el and aldosterone. Uh, if it's aldosterone synthase, that's a pretty rare one. You can just take aldosterone. Cortisol is normal. Desmolase is super rare. Uh, in fact, 
patients don't or kids don't live, babies don't live with this enzyme because if you knock if you can't make pregenolone, you can't make any of this stuff. So that's a fatal one. And luckily it's really, really rare. But I want you to remember 21 hydroxylase with 20 21 hydroxylase uh, deficiency. What's that mean, deficiency? Ah, that means there's a mutation somewhere in the gene that makes it. And maybe it works a little, but it doesn't work normal, or maybe it doesn't work at all. But that's a very common cause of uh, hypoadrenalism or Addison's disease. And we'll talk all about Addison's disease. You really want to, if you're the bio, if you're a molecular biologist, I mean, this, this stuff was fun, wasn't it, back in the day? There's a angiotensin two binds to a glomerulosa cell in the zona glomerulosa. And yeah, all this stuff, IP3 pathway stimulates release of calcium, stimulates the creation of the star uh, enzyme, and cholesterol is sucked into the mitochondria. It's converted by our P450. There's our first step, right? P450 uh, SCC in a gene creates the cholesterol demylase enzyme, and that was that first step to make pregenolone. And then weirdly, pregenolone goes to progesterone. Progesterone goes back in to the mitochondria. So biochemistry, really weird here, right? But here's our important step. There's our 21-hydroxylase enzyme allows uh, the kind of the pathway to go back into the mitochondria. And there's our aldosterone synthesis, that last step there. So I will ask questions on that stuff. So hopefully you know a little bit of that from biochemistry. Enzymes needed to make aldosterone. There's just a recap of this stuff. Uh, so there's the cholesterol side chain cleaving enzyme. Uh, I like cholesterol demylase better. Hopefully that would be on board, I would hope. Uh, there's all the AKs, SCC. It's a P450 cytochrome family enzyme. So there's its name for the gene, uh, P450 SCC. Yeah, first step, we already know that. There's our 21 hydroxylase we talked about. Super important, right? You can't live without this enzyme. Aldosterone synthase, that last step conversion of corticosterone to aldosterone. So yeah, know, know something about that. All right, now let's focus down on aldosterone itself. We talked about it being released, but let's get a little bit deeper in that. I'll take a little water here, save my voice. I apologize again. I'm not going to have time to edit that stuff out. Um, yeah, so glomerulosa cells in the zone of glomerulosa. We already know this. Spits out aldosterone. Uh, there are three ligands or three stimuluses that cause its release from glomerulosa cells. The, in order, number one most powerful uh, is increased potassium ion, hyperkalemia, right? Uh, really will trigger tons of aldosterone to be released. Then we have the one we talked about, angiotensin II. Right? Angiotensin II, by the way, has zero effect on the zona fasciculata or zona reticularis. So angiotensin II doesn't have anything with with regard to the release of cortisol or the release of DHEA. Okay, and of course, adrenal corticotropic hormone, we said it can also bind to glomerulosa cells, cause the release of aldosterone. It's not super powerful, but to have full power, you need that to be uh, working as well. You can't have full power release of aldosterone without it. All right, uh, its release is mainly controlled by serum concentrations of potassium ion. We already said that one, right? That was the strongest release of aldosterone. Angiotensin II is in second place. The aldosterone is only made in the zona glomerulosa, in the adrenal gland, nowhere else. Let's go through some fun facts. Let's see, this is how long is this? It's supposed to be just an hour, so we won't go crazy on this stuff. Uh, it, 90%, it exerts 90% of all mineral corticoid activity in the body. Uh, cortisol, this is interesting. Cortisol, which we'll talk about next time, also has a significant mineral corticoid activity. So what's that mean, mineral corticoid activity? It acts like aldosterone, right? It can bind to aldosterone's receptors, and, and in some cases it can to stimulate a response, but in most cases, it's like it blocks the receptors and nothing happens. Uh, so it's not good to have cortisol binding uh, to your aldosterone receptors. 
Uh, for example, aldosterone's mineral corticoid activity is about 3,000 times greater uh, than cortisol. But here's the problem. The concentration of cortisol in the plasma is 2,000 times greater than aldosterone. There's, therefore, and they bind about the same with the same affinity. So this would be a problem uh, if it weren't for an enzyme with a crazy ridiculous name. 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 2. Oh my gosh. Thank goodness for that enzyme though, because that deactivates cortisol in the tissues uh, that have that have a high density of aldosterone of aldosterone receptors. So thank goodness for this guy. So cortisol can bind to aldosterone's mineral cortico, or mineral corticoid receptor with high affinity. Uh, except in the kidney. So the kidney's spared. We don't have to worry about that, at least. Uh, cortisol's binding affinity is just as high as aldosterone, as I said. Luckily, cortisol is normally blocked from this mischievous binding uh, to aldosterone's receptors by this crazy enzyme, 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 2. Uh, so cortisol, so what does it do? What is this? How does this enzyme save the day? If cortisol is anywhere near aldosterone's receptors, it grabs it and converts it into cortisone. And cortisone does not bind. Well, it still can bind a tiny bit, but its binding affinity is terrible. Uh, so it saves the day. It can't block aldosterone's receptors, in other words. So that's an important enzyme. Some key enzymes. Oh, there are two key enzymes. We, we've went over this already. Two key enzymes, the 21 hydroxylase created by the gene, the CYP21 gene. We have aldosterone synthase. We talked about this already. Uh, then there's cholesterol demylase is really not that important because it's fatal. But nevertheless, though, these are the two key enzymes. There's a third one. We can have mutations in these enzymes. 21 hydroxylase is prime target of an autoimmune disease, as we said, causes. I will get, we'll talk about that when time comes. Here's this again, remember? I don't need to go through this, I don't think again. Um, yeah, we already went through that, but there it is again. There's our 21 hydroxylase. If you have a mutation in the gene that makes 21 hydroxylase, can you make cortisol? No. Can you make aldosterone? No. Can you make estradiol, which is one of the estrogens? Yeah. Can you make DHEA? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, sure. Pregnenolone. Uh, so you need DHEA, which is dehydroepiandosterone. DHEA is probably easier to say. Uh, but you can, androstenedione is made from that. So androstenedione, of course, is converted. To, there's your testosterone. And testosterone can, can be converted into estrogen or estradiol. These are the two forms of esterone and estradiol, the two forms of uh, the estrogens. More fun facts. Oh, great. We love fun facts. Uh, is by far the major, major mineral corticoid. Makes, I think we said that. Makes up 90% of mineral corticoid secretions by the zona glomerulosa. It is one of the body's most powerful sodium retaining hormones. Aldosterone will look at the effects on the kidney, exactly review that. Uh, but it, it conserves salt and water. It causes the uptake of sodium in water. And this is really important to remember, this little stuff. I'm going to go over this like 10 times. But you probably should know this from Dr. Doe. Uh, but remember, it aldosterone causes sodium and water to be pulled out of the filtrate, right? What's the filtrate? That's the P, right? It's the future P, the urine. Uh, and in place of that, it kicks out potassium and hydrogen ion. you got to remember that. you got to drill that in your brains if you don't know that already. Uh, hyperaldosteronism, so we'll talk about this more specific, but to whet your appetite. If you have too much aldosterone, what, well, what does aldosterone do? It causes sodium and water intake. It's going to cause too much solder, sodium water a reabsorption. Where does that reabsorbed sodium water go? It goes into the interstitium, which goes into the blood. So uh, basically you're getting more sodium water in the blood. What's that going to do to your blood pressure? causes hypertension, right? Increase sodium, increase water reabsorption, increase blood volume equals increased blood pressure. Pretty simple stuff, I think. Although people usually don't do good on the test. 
Is the first test the bad one? Yeah, the first test is the one people think the average is usually like 67, 70%. You guys, and usually these are the parts you screw up. Uh, so be mindful of that. Uh, aldosterone, we said, is there's aldosterone in the turtle, the slow poke. As we mentioned, the glomerulosis cells, uh, its response is quite slow because aldosterone is not stored anywhere. Uh, you have to make it from scratch. It can take days to reabsorb, or it can take days to restore blood volume, but this is a, one of the main mechanisms blood volume is restored. Sympathetic tiger we talked about last time. I can shoot your blood pressure. Uh, we talked about orthostatic hypotension where you get out of bed real quick and you, your blood pressure drops like a stone. The sympathetic tiger can normalize that within seconds, normally, unless you have early Parkinson's disease or something. General response to aldosterone ultimately boosts blood volume and pressure by stimulating the kidney to conserve. We know this stuff already, right? It's conserved salt and water. What about the inhibitors? So aldosterone is inhibited by dopamine, uh, atronatriatic peptide, heparin, somatostatin. Won't get into that stuff, though. Oh, more fun facts. So it has some acid-base effects, right? Hyperaldosterone, hypoaldosteronism, hyperaldosterone, yeah. Well, how does it have an acid-base acid effect on the blood? Well, we said aldosterone, when it's released, it kicks hydrogen ion out, trades them for sodium. So what if it kicks too many hydrogen ions out, if you have hyperaldosteronism? Well, if you kick too many hydrogen ions out of the blood, the blood's going to become basic, right? Uh, so more basic, that means its blood pH is going to increase, but it becomes more basic. Make sure you don't mess that pH. Increased pH means basic. Decreased pH means acid. So you develop metabolic uh, alkalosis, right, because of that. And that can be a problem. It also, f sodium, we can have problems with sodium, right, because if you have hypoaldosteronism, it kicks, I'm sorry, potassium. We can have problems with potassium because if you take in too much potassium, or if, you, if aldosterone is too high, it kicks out too much potassium. Uh, and then you have hypokalemia, right? Hypokalemia. Uh, and this really clinically doesn't, I mean, for, for testing like the CCP test and stuff, that makes good on paper. In the real world, we'll talk about it more. In the real world, it doesn't really happen that often. There's compensatory mechanisms that override it clinically. Uh, what does it bind to? Well, we know it binds to the mineral corticoid receptors. There's the MR1 and MR2 receptor. These receptors are not ubiquitous. They're not, what does that mean, not ubiquitous? What's ubiquitous mean? They're everywhere. So these guys are not everywhere. Like glucocorticoid receptors are everywhere. They're ubiquitous. These ones are not. Uh, the highest density are, are found definitely in the distal nephron principal cells in particular. The distal colon, and probably the distal intestine as well, because, I mean, that's just like a little nephron in a way. We'll look at that when the time comes. Hippocampus of the brain. They're also lower density, but they're still significant uh, in the proximal gastrointestinal tract. And unfortunately, a little sad face, in the cardiovascular system. We talked about that. If those receptors wouldn't, there, uh, wouldn't be there, hyperaldosteronism wouldn't ruin the heart, things that have our 2A system turned on too much. We talked about those already. Why does too much aldosterone do, or what does it do? We've talked about this. I guess I could probably get rid of some of these slides, but increased serum levels of aldosterone is called hyperaldosteronism, and here's the effects. It, has, it increases salt and therefore water, so that's going to cause hypertension, right? Uh, it also increases the reabsorption of salt, as we said. So that's going to cause hypernatremia. Hypernatremia, too much salt, has all kinds of sequelae as well. We'll look at that more specific. Uh, what does too much... Okay, we're still talking about that. It also suppresses plasma renin, plasma renin levels, right? Aldosterone 
It's usually triggered by increased levels of renin, but aldosterone uh, will usually raise the blood pressure. And if the blood pressure is strong in those renal arteries, it's going to shut off all those mechanisms. Juxtaglomerular apparatus will shut off, and then your renin will shut off. What about potassium levels? Uh, so potassium will be kicked out. So it has to be severe, though, we said. If it's really severe hyperaldosteronism, uh, that could cause hypokalemia. We said we had ways to overcome that. Uh, but if you do have it, it's really serious. It could cause severe muscle weakness. Uh, when potassium plasma levels decrease by 50%, you're actually a mess. Decrease electrical excitability. It's a, a very serious problem, but it's really tough to get that one out of whack. Metabolic acidosis, we already talked about that. Oh, sorry, metabolic alkalosis with hyperaldosteronism. Hydrogen is kicked out too much, and that raises the blood period. I could probably take this slide out. Uh, too little aldosterone secretion, that's called hypoaldosteronism. The opposite things are going to happen. So if you don't have enough aldosterone, principal cells are going to not be able to to reabsorb salt and water. Okay, so what's that going to do to your blood pressure if you can't keep replacing some of the water that's lost in the proximal nephron? Well, your blood pressure is going to be in the tank because we need that salt and water to boost it up. So you're going to have hypotension. It's called orthostatic hypotension. You're going to be urinating all the time because we're used to pulling that water out of the nephron and you're not. So it's going to go in the urine. So you're going to have polyuria. You're going to have hyponatremia as well uh, because you can't reabsorb the sodium out of the filtrate. You're going to have hyperkalemia, uh, which is, can cause heart arrhythmias, and we'll look at these more specific as well. You'll have metabolic acidosis, right? Why? Because you're not kicking hydrogen ion out like you're supposed to. This is a really general slide. I'm not really going into how this stuff works, but nice, easy CCP exam study, board study, easy my test study. Uh, now, how about diarrhea? Well, think of the intestines just like nephrons. Uh, so if you can't reabsorb water, if you don't have aldosterone, you can't reabsorb water uh, from the filtrate. Well, the same thing. You can't reabsorb water from the fecal material. You need aldosterone to, reabs to help reabsorb water from the intestine. And if your poop is too watery, what does it equal? Watery diarrhea. All right, I think that is enough. Let's leave it. I think we got probably more than 30 slides. So hyperkalemia, what effects does having aldosterone? Let's leave it right there, and we'll get that in the next session. All right, talk to you guys later.